Father, we just thank you right now for your presence here today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the ability to be able to gather here in your name. I'd like you to stand to your feet today, and I want us to pray today for Israel and for Palestine. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your gates. Just since last Monday, over 2,000 rockets have been fired at Israel. And, uh, you know, it's terrible what's happening there. And, um, but you know, as the church, the Bible commands us to pray for the people of Israel, for the Jewish people. He loves them. They're his people. We owe them so much. And, uh, you know, I want to pray for freedom as well for the Palestinian people. Freedom from the Islamo-fascists that are running that place. And this is the reality. If this nation was to fire rockets at United Kingdom, or the United Kingdom were to fire them at France, there would be a response. Because every government has a responsibility to protect their people. And I think it's so important that we're praying for that part of the world because we are seeing prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes. As you see nations around the world rising up against Israel. And I thank God that the nation of Israel exists because I do not know of any place in this world where Jewish people could really be safe. And you know, that's an end time spirit. It's a spirit. Satan hates the Jewish people. You know, loving the Jewish people doesn't mean that you have to hate the Palestinian people. We can love them both. But we as Christians are indebted to the Jewish people. When you read this book, so I want us to pray today, Lord. We pray for peace in Israel. We pray for the protection of Israel, Lord. You've called, Lord, that the time will come when there will be one new man, when you will bring Jew and Gentile together, Lord God. But we pray for them. We pray you will protect them. We pray you would reveal yourself to them. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, defeat every enemy that seeks to rise up, Lord. Uh, you know, every, every nation that seeks to rise up against the Jewish people, Lord God, we bless them. We bless the nation of Israel, and we pray you would protect them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise you, Father. Glory to Jesus. Well, let me see your faces. It's so good to finally see people here again. Uh, you know, for the last, I don't know how long we've been speaking to a camera, and we appreciate all of you that have been praying for us and watching online. But you know, it's so wonderful to have you here in person. Amen. And um, so the Lord gave me a very special message, and uh, it's, it's a, a series uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about courageous. And I want to start with a story. You know, a man had been sick uh, for quite some time. And fearing that his end was near, he calls for his wife uh, to his bedside. And he said, I have a last wish. He says to her, anything, dear, promise me that in six months after I die, you will marry our neighbor, Ken. The wife is perplexed. But my dear, I thought you hated Ken. I do, he replies. Some of you get that later. But you know, fear can make you do terrible things. And um, you know, there are thousands of phobias in the world. Uh, you know, one survey said that approximately 10% of American people suffer from phobias of some kind. And I'm sure it's no different here in Europe. And you know, these fears range from the expected um, ophidiophobia, which is fear of snakes, um, to reasonable, which is algophobia, which is fear of pain, uh, to understandable, which is acrophobia, fear of heights, and to the strange atrophobia, fear of flowers, to the downright weird, cacophobia, fear of ugliness. Yes, you are so ugly, it scares me. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, and here we have the fall of man, and then it says the eyes of both of them are opened, 
And they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And God called to Adam and said, where are you? Amen. And so fear always causes us to hide away, to walk in the shadows instead of the light. Amen. To hide our, our, our strengths, our gifts, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations buried out of a fear of, of rejection or failure or criticism. And uh, you know, since the Garden of Eden, mankind has struggled with fear. And you know, it manifested itself immediately after the fall. That is why they hid themselves from God. And um, you know, fear appeared at the same time as its fellow travelers, sin and death. And you know, fear is an unnatural state of being for us as humans. Amen? Because it's something we resent because deep down we know that we were created for joy, happiness, peace, and success. And this is why mankind is ever seeking the place, person, or thing that will finally bring them happiness or fulfillment. I will be happy when... I get a job, I get a house, I get a holiday, when I get a wife, a husband, kids, promotion, a divorce, an inheritance, when I get out of debt. And you know, these are famous last words because you know what, if you won't be happy here, you won't be happy there. You know, many a man traded in his wife for a newer model only to discover that he had a better deal first time round. Amen. And so this is the reality because people are constantly looking to find fulfillment in all the wrong, the wrong places. And so much of that unhappiness is rooted in fear. And, and this is what we need to understand today because in spite of where we go or what we accomplish or achieve in life, we can seem to shake fear, fear of failure, fear of lack, fear of being alone, fear of being trapped, fear of dying. And for some, fear of living, and this is why we're irresistibly drawn to courage, because even the most fearful among us want to live courageously. Because you know what, courage or cowardice could ultimately summarize every life. Did we live big and brave, or like so many others, did we cower in fear? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but one of power of love and a sound mind. So clearly, fear isn't from heaven, it's from hell. You see, we're called to be courageous. And some of you need to hear this, because over this last year, you have been literally brainwashed um, uh, through the media to think that fear is good. That fear is wisdom. That fear is somehow virtuous. No, it is not. Fear is not part of your identity as a child of God. Now, some of you have got offended already. You're not, listen, it's been nine months aside from Christmas. Some of you have got offended already by me simply saying that. But you know what? Fear is not meant to be part of your identity as a child of God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. I choose faith, not fear, okay? So anyway, you're a child of God and God calls you courageous and so it's time to live by it like it, amen? We walk by faith, not fear. Romans chapter one and verse 16. And it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written to Joshua by faith. So we are called to go from faith to faith. Amen. We're not called to be ruled by unbelief and fear. We're called to be led by the spirit and to walk in faith. Amen. So this is important for us to grasp this. Uh, Romans chapter 4 and verse 17 talks about Abraham. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Abraham had no proof in the natural. He had to take it by faith. He had to accept by faith that he was a father because God calls things that are not as though they are. And it says, I have made you a father of many nations. You know what? Some of you look like a failure, but God says, I've made you a success. Some of you look like you're single and God says, I've made you married. Amen. It just takes a while for that promise to manifest, but you need to take it by faith today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All the single ladies said amen. Um, but it says, 
<laughs> God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider the, uh, his body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. How many of you know God is able? Amen. But we have to believe. And over and over again, it talks here about Abraham believed God. Because you see, God sees things in you that you can't even see in your yourself. But you will never see those callings birthed, those gifts manifested, or those promises come to pass unless you are courageous. You know, courage is simply defined as not being deterred by danger or pain. It means to be brave. And this ultimately is a choice, not a feeling or emotion. You can choose courage. How many of you know you can choose courage even if you don't feel it? You know, one of the most liberating uh, revelations you can get in this life is that you can feel the fear and do it anyway. That you can act courageously in spite of feeling fear. You see, God called Gideon a mighty man of valor because he saw him for what he could be as opposed to what he was. And make no mistake, Gideon was afraid. Judges 6.12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, the new living. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you the ESV, and the angel Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor, the King James, and the angel Lord appeared unto him and said, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor, amen, and so God sees you as a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor, did you know that your heavenly father sees the best in you? Amen? He believes in you even when nobody else does. Even when you don't believe in yourself, your heavenly Father sees things in you. He believes in you. He will stand by you. And even when you feel afraid, God calls you courageous. Hallelujah. Amen? Psalm 56 and verse 3 in the New Living. But when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. You know, David, the mighty giant slayer, understood that it's inevitable at times that we will feel fear, worry, anxiety, or maybe even panic attacks. But you see, faith is always the answer to fear. Child of God, you are courageous, and you need to believe that in Jesus' name. Because you know what? We walk in a long line of courageous men and women of God. Early saints who chose to walk unarmed into gladiator arenas, facing professional killers and all sorts of wild animals, rather than deny their father or their faith. Missionaries like Hudson Taylor and David Livingston who left everything behind them to face hardship, disease, and danger to take the message of the gospel to a lost world. You know, when Amy Carmichael, who was a great missionary in India, she received a letter from a young lady considering life as a missionary. And the young lady asked her, what is missionary life like? Carmichael wrote back, missionary life is simply a chance to die. You see, we are called to lay our lives down and serve our Savior. Again, we're walking in a long line. Uh, preachers like Paul the Apostle and John Wesley, who literally faced riots wherever they went. You know, revivalists like Charles G. Finney and Jonathan Edwards, who boldly proclaimed Christ without apology or reserve to their generation. They weren't preaching about climate change. They weren't woke as they call it today. They weren't preaching about all these side issues. They were preaching the gospel. And they weren't talking about how great you were. They were saying that you were a sinner on your way to hell. You needed to repent. Give your life to Jesus. It wasn't politically correct, but it was biblically correct. And we need to get back to the gospel. Could somebody say thank you, Jesus? Amen. If you respond today, I might even start to preach in Jesus' name. Come on. Glory to God. Amen. We are called to serve him. You know, men and women, they proclaim Christ to their generation. Or men like David Brainerd, you know, literally coughing up blood as he was trudging through the snow on his way to preach the gospel to the American Indians. That man died at 29 of tuberculosis. But you know what? All that he suffered didn't stop him from having a fruitful ministry to the American Indians. Why? He knew he was called. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. 
Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. They gave their very best. Now it's our turn. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at courageous men and women of God and ask the simple question, are we living the courageous life that God has called us to? Because all who follow Christ are called to be strong and courageous. You know, it took courage for Abraham to leave his family and friends and go to a land when he didn't even know where he was going. It took courage to attack four kings and their armies with just 380 of his own, 18 of his own men to rescue Lot. And it definitely took courage, you know, to accept the call to fatherhood at 100 and motherhood at 90. Amen. Moses courageously went back to Egypt, the very nation he had fled 40 years earlier after failing to bring deliverance to his people and murdering a man. You know, it was a death sentence in the natural. You know, think of how slave owners in the deep south would have responded to a demand to release their slaves. You would have probably been lynched. How much more when Moses was being sent back to Egypt to confront Pharaoh and to tell him to let his entire workforce go. You know, Pharaoh is a man who had the power of life and death and who was answerable to no one and to have the boldness to walk up to him and say, let my people go, i.e. they're not your people, they're his people. Amen. We need to we need to understand it took courage to do this and God wants us to have courage. It took courage for Joshua to take the promised land, for David to face Goliath, Esther the king, the Hebrew children the fiery furnace and Daniel the lion's den. How many of you know fear has no place in your heart or your mind in the name of Jesus? Amen. How many of you said, you know what, I'm done with fear. I'm done with being ruled by fear in Jesus' name. I'm called to be courageous. That's okay. I'm going to preach my sermon even if you stand there like, like, you know, know, hallelujah, like your statue. That's okay. I'm going to preach this message and it's going to change you in Jesus' name. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Hopefully, over the coming weeks, We're going to take some time to reflect on these stories and consider how this can inspire us to live big and brave too. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, here talking about Jesus, it says, Therefore, since we have surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus. You can look to Bill Gates. You can look to Dr. Fauci. You can look to whoever you want to. I'm going to look to Jesus. I'm looking to Jesus. I'm looking to Jesus. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It took courage to go to the cross, but he did it. You know why? Because he loves you. Amen. And he has called you. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Praise you, Jesus. I'm focused on him. Christ is our example in courage. Why? Because he courageously laid aside his reputation and his will in order to do God's will. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Give a shout of praise to Jesus. Come on, give a shout of praise to the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord, and I want to declare that today. Come on, declare that over Ireland. Jesus Christ is Lord. One more time. Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, thank you, Jesus. Jesus is our example. He took our place on that cross, dying in our stead. And even when he was accused, he didn't answer. He bore our sin and shame. And I'm grateful that we are called to walk in the footsteps of our courageous Savior. Isaiah 53 and 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Do you know how hard it is to not open your mouth when you're being accused, when you're being criticized? But this is what Jesus did. Why? The Bible says in Isaiah 50 verse 7 that he set his face like flint. Why? Because Christ is courageous. Amen? In light of this, fear... Cowardice or selfish self-interest has no place in your heart or in your life. Amen. It is never an option. Cowardice is never an option for a child of God. Why? We're called to be brave. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Deuteronomy 31 6 be strong and courageous do not be afraid or terrified because of them for the Lord your God goes with you he will never leave you nor forsake you you see courage doesn't mean that you don't feel fear it just means that you don't let fear stop you you don't let fear dominate you you don't let fear dictate your decisions because many dream of victory but only the courageous take the land let me say that again. Many dream of victory, but it's only the courageous who take the land. You will never take your land without courage. And God has a land for every one of us. God planted a garden for Eden, uh, for Adam and Eve. He has planted a garden for you. But you're going to have to have courage to go and take that in the name of Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Courageous take the land. That's why I want to start with the story of Joshua. Because I think there are many parallels with where our nation is right now. We're coming out of a time of restraint, frustration, limitation, and loss. But now it's time for us to leave the heartbreak and the disappointment and the frustration of yesterday in the past and enter into the promises of God today. It's time to take the land. That's why the book of Isaiah 43 says, forget the former things, do not consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. How many of you are ready for God to do a new thing? We're not going back to the way church was. We're stepping into what God has for us. He has an anointing for us today. And I believe there's a new boldness. There's a new power that's going to be manifest. Signs, wonders in Jesus' name. The, the church is going to be different in Jesus' name. I believe that. So I want to read Joshua chapter 1, verse to, to, um, 1 to 10. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving them, the children of Israel. You know, it was Charles Wesley, John Wesley's brother, who said, God buries his workmen, but continues on his work. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We only have today. The Bible says, you know, uh, walk while you have the light. Amen. None of us are here forever. And here, God acknowledges Moses and all he did, but then he said, now, Moses is dead. It's time to move on. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And he said, every place the sole of your foot will tread, I've given to you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man, ha ha ma sheke Hallelujah. The very same Bible that gives you the assurance of salvation gives the Jewish people the assurance of their land. That may not be politically correct, but that's a fact. The word of God says that land is theirs, that they have every right to be there, that they are the indigenous people to that land. Amen. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse six, listen to this. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. When God repeats himself twice, you better be hearing what he's saying. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, then you will have good success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? This is the third time. Be strong and of good courage. When God commands you to do something, you better listen. And when God repeats himself three times in a very brief uh, uh, you know, passage, you need to hear what he's saying. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The children of Israel had a promise, but for them to enter into that promise, they were going to need to be strong and courageous. For those who serve God, courage isn't a suggestion, it's a divine command. 
Because God knows there can be no crown without a cross, no testimony without a test, no triumph without a trial. In light of this, therefore, it's essential that we are courageous people of faith, people who stand in faith, people who possess the promises. I'm reminded of the words of Winston Churchill. Success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. And he would know, seeing as he courageously resisted Hitler's demand for an unconditional surrender in World War II. Even though resistance seemed utterly futile, France had an army that was approximately 10 times the size of Great Britain's army, and they had just surrendered. And yet, he just didn't quit. Amen? In spite of the overwhelming odds, and by God's grace, Great Britain and all of the allies prevailed over the forces of fascism. And the point I'm trying to make is just like Joshua and just like Churchill, you have to fight. Because it's the truly courageous who are willing to look defeat in the face and persist anyway. Because to risk, you know, this is the thing. In order to risk success, you have to be willing to, ris to risk failure. Amen? And this is the problem. Most of us quit long before the final whistle is blown. Most of us quit long before the final bell rings. But you know, Jesus said in John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. So remember, anybody today have some trouble in your life? How many of you are sitting next to trouble? I, I don't do that. Don't, that's wrong. But you know what, it's biblical. Jesus warned, he said, you're gonna have trouble. The King James, but these things I've spoken to you, that you might have, in me you might have peace. In the world, ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Because whether you like it or not, times of testing are coming. Paul the Apostle spoke about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 when he spoke of, you know, uh, perilous times would come. Men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, uh, boasters, proud, uh, abusers, blasphemers, uh, lovers of, of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know, Paul warned us uh, that these times would come. You see, we're not the first generation to see tough times and we certainly won't be the last. You know, Job chapter 38, gives us some advice, and um, Job 38 and verse three. Now prepare yourself like a man, I will answer you, and you shall answer me. In the King James it says, gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee an answer uh, thou me. So again, it says to gird up your loins. First uh, Peter 1 13 says, you know, gird up the loins of your mind, amen? And, uh, you know, there's a reason why it says this to us. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought you to the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, both of these verses present us with the image of a soldier who tucks his flowing garment inside a belt in order to avoid tripping during the battle. Because they had these long cloaks, and you could trip over it in a battle, but when the battle would come, they would gird up their loins. They would they'd get this cloak and just put put it inside the belt so that they are ready for the battle, amen? This is why we need the belt of truth, amen? The reality is this, the virus we just went through is only the beginning of what is to come in the final days, amen? So again, we need to be realistic. Jesus warned us that these times would come, Matthew 24. And it says, the disciples came to Jesus As he sat in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. In Luke, Jesus said the same thing. One of the characteristics of the end times will be deception. This is why some of you need to turn your TV off and open your Bible. You just heard from God right there. Some of you need to turn off this, this 24 hour news that you've been feeding on over the last year and open your Bible. Faith comes by hearing. And this is the problem. Some of you have been hearing the wrong thing. All you've been hearing for last year, COVID, 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 COVID. And it's got to the point where you've been just brainwashed and full of fear. I'm not to listen. We're, we're taking appropriate you know, response in terms of what we're doing here. But at the same time, we're called to walk by faith, not fear. 
feel free to be offended. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ, they will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. It doesn't say the end, it says the beginning. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And you will not endure without courage. Verse 14, and this gospel. You see, we're not to focus on the signs. The Bible never said to focus on Jesus acknowledged them. But he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And then the end shall come. My focus is on preaching the gospel. I'm not going to apologize to anybody for that. And I'm not going to stop. That is my calling. That is what I'm called to do. And that is what you're called to do as well. Whether you realize it or not, we are called to take this gospel to a lost and a dying world. I thank God that Paul and the early apostles were not so focused on their safety that they refused to take this message. Somebody somewhere had to come to, to all of the various countries where you are with the gospel. In many instances, at great danger and many times laying down their own lives to do so. Patrick risked life and limb to come to this nation 1,500 years ago and preach the gospel of Jesus. That's why I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel. That is my calling and I will not apologize to anyone for it. Shekerebesesinemete. Christ spoke of the signs of the times. Verse 8, he refers to them to King James as birth pangs. And as those of you who have children know, the pangs become stronger and more regular the closer you come to the time of birth. The truth is this, we will face more battles, we will stand before more giants, and we will see greater opposition because as the church, we are a threat to Satan's kingdom. And this is why the church has been closed over this last year. This is not just a natural thing. You have to understand, Satan wants the churches closed. And I feel like I've been a broken record of this last year. But you know what? I make no apology for declaring I believe churches should be open because we're an essential service. People need to hear the gospel. You know, today... Is, is approximately nine months that the church was closed aside from two weeks at Christmas. And that's why I believe, you know what? We're birthing a revival. Glory to God. We're coming out of this in Jesus' name. We're not looking back to where we've come. We're looking at where we're going. And where we're going, we're going to see a glorious revival in this nation. Hallelujah. Men and women are going to give their lives to Jesus in numbers like we've never seen before. And men and women are going to go forth from this island once again with the gospel of Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, we will see greater opposition, but we will also experience greater glory. But it's no surprise because Christ warned us, like I said, Luke 21, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That is speaking of us as the church. As the redeemed, spiritual church of God, we are a hindrance to what Satan wants to manifest in terms of his antichrist agenda. And there is an antichrist agenda. If you have any discernment at all, you can see it uh, in our society. I mean, it was just even in the media recently uh, over the last few days where you, you, you know, they, they, they acknowledged even in the media that many of the changes that happened in our society over the last uh, 12 months were characteristic of totalitarianism. So listen, we can't take freedom for granted. We have to fight, we have to contend in the spirit, okay? But we will prevail in spite of Satan's plans, but only if we are courageous. And if you want these really fearful people full of fear and anxiety, this is probably, you know, I don't think you're gonna be able to take it because I'm not going back to the way I was. I believe God's gonna make me bolder than I was before, amen? Hallelujah. 
Joshua 1, again, God says, be strong and courageous. He repeats himself three times. Why? Fear or cowardice is not an option for a blood-bought believer. Joshua was about to enter into, inverted commas, the promised land. But you know what? The difference between a promise and a possession is courage. Everybody's got promises, but how many people die without ever seeing those promises come to pass? The difference between a promise and a possession is courage. They had a promised land, but they would have not seen that land if they did not have the courage to step in there and conquer what God said was theirs. You see, we will need to be courageous if we want to possess the promises of God for our lives in Jesus' name. Because in ways, it seems like an oxymoron. God says, I've given you the land, now go in and fight to possess the land I've given you. I mean, there's no natural logic to that except for the fact that God expects corresponding actions to our faith in him. It's not enough to say, oh Lord, I have faith in you. He will say, okay, well, if you have faith in me, where are your actions? Your actions should re reflect your faith. I believe God will meet my needs, but you never tithe or offer. <laughs> I believe, oh, I believe in, 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 in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but you're addicted to porn. <laughs> no, it's time. Hallelujah. The Bible says you'll be known by your fruits, not by your suits. Amen? Hallelujah. So again, we have to act. Faith is an action. Smith Wigglesworth said that over and over again. Faith is an action. So when God says be strong and courageous, that places the responsibility on us. I've already quoted 2 Timothy 1.7 says God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. But you see, courage isn't simply the absence of fear because in many instances, you can be courageous even while feeling the fear because ultimately courage is a choice. I choose to believe in spite of how I feel, in spite of how things look. You know, Napoleon Bonaparte said, courage isn't having strength to go on. It's going on when you don't have strength. You see, our world shrinks or expands in direct proportion to our courage and our faith. Because courage doesn't mean that you don't ever feel afraid. It just means you don't let fear stop you from doing what you believe God's called you to do. Amen? Hallelujah. You need to be some of you need to be courageous and push a little harder. And so, if some of you feel like you're being crushed right now, like the walls of your life are kind of closing in on you, it may be a sign that you need a little more courage and you need to push a little harder in Jesus' name. You know, Joshua chapter 3, um, you know, God speaks to Joshua. Hamas. Uh, okay. And God said, um, verse 3, he says, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests and Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. We must pursue God's presence. And do not come near it, that you may know the way by which uh, you may go, for you have not passed this way before. You know what? It's a new season for us as the church. And this is why we must pursue God's presence because we haven't been this way before. Amen? So again, did Joshua feel fear? Most likely. Uh, did he experience the what ifs? What if I haven't heard from God? What if I fail? What if God doesn't come true for us? He faced that age old question. Do I settle for good or do I push for great? Good or God? That is the question every one of us have to ask ourselves. I'm sure he was tempted to think, you know what? We had a good thing in the wilderness. Clothes that didn't wear out, free food, lots of sunshine and exercise because they were wandering around in circles for 40 years. But you, and, and you know what? They, more than anything, they had no enemies because nobody fights you when you're in the wilderness. Nobody will fight you for your place there. But the moment you decide you want to step into your dream and suddenly all of hell will mobilize to try to stop you in your track because we all face the same temptation. Do I settle for good or do I risk it all for great? Do I play it safe or do I put all my chips on the table? Like Joshua, the time comes when we have to leave all that is safe and familiar in order to step forward and possess the promised land that God has for us. You know, the desert was, it wasn't pleasant, but it was familiar and it was safe and you didn't have to fight. But you know what? He allowed God to lead him. Will you allow God to lead you? Will you allow God to lead you? Will you allow his spirit to lead you? 
Amen. And you know, there's so much more I'd love to, to share right now about this message, but we'll, we'll get into it next week. But this is the thing. I, I'd like to finish with, you know, the book of Romans chapter 8 says, as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. I know that as I've been speaking, the Spirit of God has been stirring your heart. He's been speaking to you. He's been, you know, uh, dreams and, and plans and things that you've pushed to the side and say it's impossible, it'll never happen, or oh, I could never do that, or I could never go there. No, God wants you to dream. God wants you to believe. God wants you to have courage because without courage, you're lost. Without courage, nothing will change. Without courage, your situation will be the same in a year's time as it is right now. But you know what? When you take courage, he- heaven starts to mobilize. When you take courage, angels start to come on your behalf, amen, and fight on behalf of you in Jesus' name. You see, because to every miracle, there's God's part and there's your part, amen, and that's why we're called to walk in courage. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage? Could you stand to your feet today in Jesus' name? Be strong and of good courage. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're called to be people of courage. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We're called to be people of courage. Praise you, Jesus. Just lost my Bible. Hallelujah. Could you just lift your hands to the Lord right now? I know it's been a while since some of you have been in church and maybe it feels strange. But you know what? It feels good. It feels good to be able to look you in the face. You know, we serve a face-to-face God. The Bible says God, Moses spoke to God and it was a face-to-face experience. And this is why what we're doing right now is the most normal, natural thing for us to do as believers. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. You know, the Lord is here right now. He is here right now. Jesus is in this place right now. And he loves you. Just close your eyes and lift your hands to him right now. We just want to acknowledge his presence. I know we have to finish, but just acknowledge his presence right now. You know, there's a lot of people didn't make it through this last year, but you're here because God kept you. You're here because he kept you and because he has a bigger purpose for you than what you can see right now. So I want you to just pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for keeping me, for delivering me, for protecting me. Thank you, Jesus, that, Lord, I give every fear to you. I repent of allowing fear to paralyze me. Lord, I trust you. I believe you. And I say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. I am a a person of courage because you've commanded me to be strong of good courage in Jesus name Lord I give every fear to you I give every anxiety to you Lord fill my heart with your courage in Jesus mighty name just pray in the spirit for a moment come on but you beloved building yourselves up in your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost Lord hallelujah have your way among us in Jesus name have your way among us Lord God hallelujah tear off those grave clothes of the past in Jesus name hallelujah it's a new day it's a new day it's a new day in Jesus name it's a new day Day. Glory to God. We just release the disappointments, the frustrations, the fears. We just let it go and we say, Lord, it's a new day. I'm ready in Jesus' name. Just declare it. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Declare, I'm ready for all you want to do in Jesus' name. One more thing before we pray. Lord, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, every hand down for one moment. And I want to just give this to everybody watching today. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, Hallelujah. You're, not gonna, you're never going to have that courage. You're never going to have that boldness. You're never going to have that confidence until you surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. So if you don't have that assurance that heaven is your home and Jesus is your Lord, could you do something? Just lift your hand up high and I'm going to pray for you today. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Amen. Praise God. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So if you've never accepted Jesus, put your hand up high and we're going to pray for you quickly. Amen. Praise God. Well, just for all of those who are at home, 
Just pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe in my heart that you were born of a virgin, that you lived a perfect life, that you died on the cross in my place. Come into my life, Lord Jesus Christ, and forgive me of my sins. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Could you give a shout of praise to the Lord? Come on. Hallelujah. You glad to be back in church? Come on, give a shout of praise to the Lord. In Jesus' name.